Sorry, I'm a slow writer. You're a fast talker and I'm a slow writer, so it don't go well together. I got everything. <laughs> okay. Diana, Pat, Marilyn, and Julie. Terry's asking for prayers if the swelling goes down, but she is thankful that she's able to walk around the house without a cane sometimes. And thing is, I know when I had mine replaced, it, it's about a year before you really feel comfortable. So you just got to be patient. Well, Keep this, working. Is, this one is a lot different than the first one. Oh, yeah. Any others? Yes. It's a blessing that no one was hurt in that 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 plane that the side of it blew out that Alaska Airlines 737 I've, I've flown in those and I'm telling you what those are <laughs> you wonder how they even stay in the air <laughs> I know. you heard about that on the news though didn't you no I don't watch your news oh well this Alaska Airlines plane with 737 I forget how many people were on it or I don't know, above 10,000 feet, and this thing blew out of the side of the plane. So there's a big gaping hole. Of course, they dropped all the oxygen masks, and thankfully, nobody, you know, normally something like that, somebody would be sucked out of the plane. Right. But nobody was sitting in that seat. Oh, wow. I think the seat was gone, but scary, but nobody was hurt. They said a guy lost his shirt for that. A guy's shirt got ripped off or sucked off of him and said, Yeah, sit next to it. Yeah, that was definitely. Yep. God was watching out that, oh, yeah. for that plane. Amen. Mm -hmm. Any others? I do. I just, oh. <laughs> I was just going to say, we've had a phrase, we've had beautiful snow that has been off the roads. <laughs> right. <laughs> the roads are still nice enough that the snow don't stick. That's what I kept saying all the way in. All oh, the trees are so beautiful. I love it. Yeah, like those wet snows. Uh, I want to kick back on the French uh, this. Um, we have a surgery date. It's this Thursday, pending insurance approval. She, there's kind of a praise in there too, because when they called her to schedule her, they said the first available date was February the 12th. And Beth was a little disappointed because the MRI showed the tumor was growing pretty fast and she didn't want to wait another month. And so she said, well, I'll take it if that's the first one. And so then 15 minutes later, the uh, scheduler called back and said, we've had a cancellation on the 11th. Do you want it? She says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it also made a shorter time in there for insurance approval. So, uh, so pending that approval, she will have her surgery Thursday. Um, the surgeon thinks he's going to be able to do it robotically, which is great, but that can change once he gets in there. So right. then we wait for the biopsy to see what the future holds. Okay, keep that on the prayer list, not only for surgery on Thursday, but yeah. that the insurance rushes this through and is expedient. I know insurance and rushing don't go together, but we can always pray. <laughs> That's right. But definitely keep Beth on the prayer list, no matter whether she has a surgery Thursday or not, because she definitely needs the prayers. So does her mama. <laughs> <laughs> the whole family. Yes, it's hard on the whole family. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you know this. She has tested positive for COVID three times in the last two weeks. Oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah, she can't get a negative test. So, oh. and we, she moved, she's moved Christmas, but we're finally, she finally canceled it because we were supposed to have it today. So she just finally canceled Christmas and she says, we'll do Christmas in July and have a full party. So, <laughs> so yeah, she's, yeah, she's struggling because she hasn't been able to be around people. Wow. And then with Uncle Bob just passing it two weeks ago, this, it's, she's very, that she probably wants the people around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So keep indoors in prayer. She keeps testing positive for COVID. She just can't get a negative test. Yes. I have two more, a couple more. Dustin, keep Dustin Watson on your prayers. I saw that he was down for a, 
and then the chemo treatment, they gave him the shots in his back. And then uh, John Riggle too, I don't know what his situation, I mean, I don't know how he's doing, I haven't heard anything lately, but he was going through cancer. Dustin Watson, shots in his back, and John Regal with cancer, but we're not sure what's going on with him. Any others? Yes, B. Um, Tara Marie has walking pneumonia, so please keep her in your prayers. She sounds awful. She feels awful. So, um, who is that one? Tara. Uh, Jeff's aunt and uncle are feeling a little better, but continue prayers for the surgery that he will be doing, hopefully, next week or two. And we're going to see the surgeon here shortly to get them to get it scheduled. And then there's some changes going on at the school, so with the school. Changes at school? I can't believe that. I know, right? <laughs> Keep her in the prayers. She has walking pneumonia. Jeff's aunt and uncle waiting on setting up a surgery date and changes at the school. And if, keep Cassie in your prayers, please. And Luke. And Luke. Also keep Cassie and Luke in your prayers. Any others? You're up. All right. Him. We're going to be singing page 363. Leaning on the everlasting arms, we'll sing all three verses. For everyone who can, would you please stand while we sing and remain standing for prayer? Page 363. <laughs> keeping the snow on and ice off the roads, Lord, and making it safe to travel. Father, we just cannot thank you enough for watching over events that are going to happen. Um, just keeping people safe when 
all everything that we know says that someone should have been hurt or died. And Father, we just ask that you be with the families of the people that are suffering, whether it be cancer, whether it be the flu, whether it be um, death, whatever it is, Lord, we just ask that you be with those families. Just guide and direct them and help them to feel your hand wrapped around them, protecting them, keeping them safe, and help them to see the positive side. Father, we just ask that you just bless us, guide us, and direct us in all our ways. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our communion hymn is on page 445, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and we'll sing all four verses. Take his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And again, that's Isaiah 55, 3 through 9. Uh, there's a common misapprehension about Christianity, namely that those who would become Christians were somehow or other clean, needed to clean up their act before becoming a Christian. It carries over to the question as well. Often enough, we assume we are not righteous enough 
to be effective in our prayers or in our work. This passage has an interesting counter to that thought. First, God puts out his track record in dealing with the repentant sinner. He cites as his examples his treatment of King David. Now, other than adultery, abuse, and power, and murder, David would have looked just about like any one of us. He points out that he forgive, forgave, that his mercies are faithful. Not only is his faithful in granting mercy, but he restores David to a position where he is a witness to others. Isaiah the prophet gives us the secret of being treated this way. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This implies that he is available. It also implies there is a time when it is not too late to do this. So then how, do, how does one seek the Lord? Well, first things first, seek him immediately. Don't wait until you become more righteous. Do it now. There are two primary fields of human endeavor that God focuses on. He tells the wicked to forsake what they are doing. In short, stop doing what is wrong. Simple message. The unrighteous man is, is commanded to forsake his thinking. Just because your sins are hidden in your brain doesn't make them any less sinful. We talked about that in a lot of different ways as well. One of the reasons we think this is so incredible, so hard to get, is that we put God in the same position we are. With what, we are, with what we would do in his place. And the answer is not much. But God is compassionate. This seems strange. And the answer is it is strange. At least it's strange to us. His ways are much higher than ours. It is perfectly normal that we do not understand why God forgave. It's just required that you understand he will. The bread represents his body. The cup represents his blood. It is his, his way of proving that he means it. He is compassionate. Therefore, as you partake, remember that you are commanded to examine yourself. If that examination produces repentance, do not put it off. Seek him while he may be found. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Holy Father, thank you for this special time of our service, this special time of our week, that we can come and to you and just be one-on-one -on -one with you and try to understand your ways that we do, Lord, but we know as this stated, we do not need to understand. We just need to know that you are there. We, we just need to know that you will do what you say you will do. Lord God, you gave your son Jesus for us and to us, and we just thank, are so thankful for that. And we take this time as communion, as quiet time, as time to reconnect. Lord, we just ask that our hearts and minds are open to your message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
to the new year. Lord, we look forward to our uh, travels with you, our relationship of growing, our relationship with you, Lord. We just ask now that you bless the giver, bless the receiver, and show us how to use these offerings towards your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thursday, it's like, oh, when's a good time to do that? Okay, today we're going to start out a little bit different. I would like everybody to stand. Uh, I know, no, I am not leading songs. So do not get scared. Play, place your hand over your right heart. Right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and I will hide his word in my heart, that I might not sin against God. Amen. Everybody's looking at me like, why don't you go and say Everybody's looking at me like, why in the world did you say that? Yeah, sort of so. Everybody enjoy. But it was funny because that came up in my devotional this morning and I read that and I thought, you know what, this goes so well with leading into prayer. Because when we were, I know some people are like, what? But I'll get there. When we went to Bible study, or Bible summer school, BBS, whatever they call it, vacation Bible school, then we used to start every day off like that. Pledge allegiance to the flag, pledge allegiance to the Bible, pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. Christian flag, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I knew there was another one. But the thing of it is, when we pledge that, are we still living that? See, the guy I read said that he has to remind him, so he's a pastor, and he said, even me being world-renowned pastor, because he's over in Russia right now, I have to remind myself of that pledge I made as a child, that I would keep God's word holy, that I would keep it in my heart. Because, here again, we have a tendency to get busy and forget to read God's word for days at a time. But God's word is more, this says so much, it's a lamp unto my feet. And no, this is not the sermon, this is pre-sermon. <laughs> it's a lamp unto my feet. It's a guide. It keeps the path clear for us if we follow. It tells us how to live our lives. So it not only keeps us from sinning against God, but it will also guide us through our life. Have we ever had a decision to make? Am I going to stay here or am I going to go to a different job? Am I going to live here or am I going to live there? Am I going to marry this guy or this woman or am I going to look for somebody else? You, don't you think God had a hand in that? Don't you think God sort of gave... You know, we called it a gut feeling. Uh, something inside was just telling me. We, we came up with a hundred different excuses instead of just saying, you know, God, God has guided me this my whole life. Look back on your life, how God has used different things to get you where you're at now. Because his word is a lamp unto our feet. It helps guide us. It's a light unto my path, so we don't stumble. We choose to stumble. Because there's times that we know what's right, but it's easier to do what's wrong. I will hide its word in my words in my heart. Why do we hide its words in our heart? To bring them up not only in our life, but in prayer. God loves it when we use his words 
to lead our prayers. Because what does he say? My word will not come back void. When you hit, use his word, he's made a covenant with us that it will not come back void. That there will be an answer. May not be what we're looking for, but there will be an answer to that prayer. And we're heading into prayer. So I picked out one to start with. Psalm 23. And you know, this is sort of a strange one to start out with because the only time we really hear Psalm 23 is at funerals. At the graveside. But the thing of it is, Psalm 23 has so much in it if we just study it. How many people feel like they truly know who God is? How many times do you see God in Psalm 23? Almost every verse, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's start at the beginning. The Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Ra. You ever thought about what what are we called all through the Bible? We're called sheep. The sheep will know my voice. The sheep will know the sheep, the sheep, the sheep. Has anybody ever been around sheep? I'm sorry, they are the dumbest animal I have ever seen in my life. But they're cute. They are cute. <laughs> when they're little, they're little. But the thing of it is, they do some of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Sheep are the only ones I know that will run off a cliff. Even when they know there's no more ground there. <laughs> Sheep are something, though, that takes a lot of care to raise them. The shepherds used to, at night, would put the sheep in a cave or they would stack branches and stuff around them and then they would lay in the one opening they had so that predators couldn't come in without the shepherd knowing. And the sheep couldn't take off without the shepherd knowing. The sheep is something that you can't just put out the pasture and then daydream or something you have to watch all the time God's telling us he's our shepherd so he's watching you all the time he's protecting you all the time yeah bad things happen to us but imagine what would happen to us if we didn't have that protection of God around us you know when Satan went and talked to God about Job and Satan even recognized that you've got a, a hedge of protection around him. I can't touch him. And God said, well, I'll take that down so you can get to him. Job's life wasn't perfect. His kids weren't perfect, but God still had a hedge of protection around him because he was watching out for him. Yeah, I'm sure bad things happened throughout his life, but not all the bad happened to him. There was a lot of bad that was kept away from him. 
So God is our shepherd. He is handling us with kid gloves. He is taking care of us. I shall not want. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. Have you ever noticed when times get bad, when money gets tight, you still can provide for your family if you put your trust in God? Have you ever noticed that when you do the math at the end of the month and the numbers don't add up because the bills are more than what the income is, but you still paid everything on time? And have you ever noticed it's not just what we need? He provides for a lot of our wants, too. Don't we do that for our kids? Especially this time of year we just got done with, grandkids, kids. Half the stuff we got, the kids, grandkids, didn't really need. But we wanted to give it to them. We wanted to provide it for them. If we are willing to do that for our kids and grandkids, imagine what God's willing to do for you. In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Not just part way, have it to the full. God wants us to enjoy life. A lot of people, when they don't understand Christianity, think, well, there's all these rules. You've got to do this. You can't do this. You can't do that. But the thing of it is, God wants us to live life to the full. But he wants us to do it safely. When you're raising kids, don't you give them rules? When the grandkids are over, don't they have rules at your house? We're supposed to, Michelle. Because I was mean. But the thing of it is, why do we have rules? To keep them safe. Yeah, the world says live life the way you want. If you run into a brick building, well, you shouldn't have done that, but live life the way you want. But we don't look at it that way. We look at it, but that's fine. So is being safe. You can still have tons of fun and still be safe. You can have tons of fun and still be a Christian. Because we have a joy that, yeah, we may not always be happy, but we have a joy that we're supposed to have, that God wants us to have. We're, we're supposed to have a peace that God wants us to have. Happiness and joy are two different things. A lot of people get that confused. They think, well, I'm joyful. No, you're happy. Ephesians 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We say we have blessings in heaven. We do. They're there for us. Sometimes through prayer, we have to reach out and grab those blessings and bring them to earth. What's the Lord's prayer, prayer say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. You think God just wants us to leave our spiritual gifts or blessings up in heaven? No. He wants us to ask for them. He wants us to show our faithfulness so we can receive more blessings. Fasting. I don't know how well everybody's doing that you think about it. We're one third of the way there. Um, my wife hasn't killed anybody yet. <laughs> it's been tempting, I'm sure, but she hasn't killed anybody yet. But the thing of it is, is it harder than you thought or easier than you thought? See, I, it's, it's neat for me because when you defeat the flesh, it's like, 
wow, I can do this. It isn't that I need it because it's because the flesh wants it. Here's a tough one. 23-2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The Lord is my peace. Jehovah's Shalom. How many of us truly believe that? Or how many of us get anxious? Get nervous? Get overexcited? Do we go to God or do we try to take care of it ourselves? See, when we get anxious, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to lie down. He wants us to rest. He wants us to have peace while we're resting. How many of us have peace when we rest? How many of us don't rest? <laughs> so we're doing exactly the opposite of what God wants for us. But he's got all these rules that we have to follow. But we have all these choices we have to make. It isn't about the rules, it's about the choices. Because rule is, you're not supposed to drive over 55 on the highway. The choice is, I drive at least 55 on the highway. It's different. We, we have tons of rules around. You're not supposed to do murder, but we have prisons full of murderers. You're not supposed to steal from somebody, but we have jails full of thieves. You're not supposed to drink too much, but we have people get DUIs every day. So, do people avoid Christianity because of the rules or because of the choices they want to make? Because the world has rules. Do we choose to follow them? He restores my soul. The Lord is my healer. Jehovah Rapha. The word Rapha or Rapha means the Lord is my healer, physically and spiritually. But when we're in pain, how often do we ask God for healing? We might go to him in prayer and beg him for healing, but how often do we ask him with expectation for healing? See, prayer is sort of like going in front of a judge. How many defense attorneys have you heard walk up and go, Judge, this guy's guilty. Judge, you gotta, you gotta put him in jail because he's guilty. You got to put him in jail because that would keep the public safe. No, they go up there and they say, Your Honor, this man is guilty. He deserves to be put in prison. He needs to be put in prison to keep the public safe. He goes in with expectation that the judge is going to agree with him. And the defense attorney does the same thing. Your Honor, my client was nowhere near that place. Yes, you have videos showing that he was there, but he really wasn't there. That wasn't him. <laughs> Let's be honest, we've all seen it and heard it. But so they both go in front of the judge with the expectation that the judge is going to side with them. They don't go in front of the judge begging him to do what they want. They go in front of the judge expecting him to side with them. That's what we're supposed to do in prayer. If we're using God's word, my word will not come back void, and we believe that it's going to happen, how can his word come back void? 
may not happen the way we want it to, may not happen the way we're expecting it to, but it will happen. May not happen when we want it to or expect it to, but it will happen. In Exodus 15, 26, it said, He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commandments and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I'm the Lord who heals you. He wants to heal us. But we have to do what the Bible tells us to do. Jeff will love this one. Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, you ain't gonna believe this, but that train vibrated just enough to move my computer in a completely different section. And by his wounds, we are healed. It's done. It is finished. We are the done Christians, not the do Christians. We live in a done era. There's nothing more we can do except have faith. Have faith that God's going to do what he has shown us all through the Bible that he does. Back in the Old Testament, their sins were forgiven on a goat or a lamb or a cow or an animal. But they had to do it every year. They were do Christians. They had to do something every year to get forgiveness. But then Jesus came, the perfect lamb. And he created a done culture for us. But we have to still live the right way. You know, there's nobody that God doesn't want to come to him. No matter what they've done, no matter how much they bad they've done, he loves everybody. When your grandkids are bad, when they do the worst thing you can think of, don't you still love them? When your kids go out and break the law, don't you still love them? You hate what they're doing, but you still love them. You don't agree with how they live, but you still love them. If we can do that, imagine what God can do. Psalm 23, 3. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jehovah's sick man. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah 33, 15 and 16 says, Hear and pay attention. Do not be arrogant, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings the darkness before your feet. Stumble on the darkening hills. You hope for light, but he will turn it to utter darkness and change it to deep gloom. Doesn't that sort of go with what we started out with? I will make it a lamp unto my feet. It will light unto my, a light unto my path. He is righteous. He wants us to live righteous lives. If we don't, yeah, there is punishment. If your kids don't do what you tell them to, don't they get punished? Or do we just say, well, you know, they're just kids. I know some parents do, unfortunately, today. And that's why our schools are out of control. I'm sorry. A little side note, but but the thing of it is, when I worked in the juvenile center, nobody got punished the way them kids did. But most kids didn't do what those kids did. But the thing of it is, when we can punish them, they acted completely different than what they do now. The, 
DOC has taken pretty much all the punishment out. And it's not just the DOC, it's the schools, it's everywhere. Because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. We don't want to correct someone because maybe just because they don't think the way we do, we don't want to. But God corrects us when we don't do what we're supposed to do. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Lord is my help, Jehovah Ezer. No matter what we're going through, if we turn to Christ, if we pray, if we truly pray, and if we share with other Christians so they can pray for us, there's a peace that will come over you. There's a peace that will fill you that no matter how hectic things are, it's like you know what God's plan is. You know that he's with you. No matter what the end results, he's still there. That's one thing a lot of people don't understand is they feel like God has left them, but that isn't the case. They have left God. Why does he let bad things happen to good people? He doesn't. He allows bad things to happen to people. Why? To bring people closer to him. Job lost his family, but he never stopped praising God. Job lost his, everything he owned, but he never stopped praising God. We hit a bump in the road, and first thing we do is, why, God, why did you do that? Job's wife was begging him to curse God so he could die. But Job's thought was, I came to the world with nothing, I'm leaving the world with nothing. If you can't tell, I've studied Job quite a bit lately. <laughs> but I've come to the world with nothing, I've left the world with nothing. So why do we expect that we deserve more than what we came into the world with? Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. No matter who's against us, God is there to protect us. Elisha had made enemies with several kings. And his servant wakes up and he goes, Elisha, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. But Elisha didn't get scared. What did he do? He prayed to God. God opened my servant's eyes. When the servant's eyes were opened, what happened? There were legions of angels surrounding Elisha. Because Elisha knew that God was going to protect him. The protection may not look the way we want, but it's still protecting us. It may not feel like we feel like it should feel, but he's still protecting us. You know, we talk about how we lose things, how we give up things. But God gave up everything. To come down here on earth as a human being so that we could be forgiven. He could have been selfish and said, you know what, I'll just destroy the earth and I'll start all over. How many times have we done that? Been building something that ain't going the way we want, it didn't go the way we want, finally we get mad and it ends up in the garbage and we start over. But he doesn't. He has restarted the earth a few times. I mean, he destroyed the earth with a flood that he promised he'd never do again. But he didn't completely start over. He still has hope for us. No matter how bad we treat him, no matter how bad we live our lives, he still has hope for us. But how many people have you given up hope on? 
thinking they're never going to come around. They're never going to change their ways. They're never going to see the light. But see, we can't control them. But the thing of it is, we've got a God who can. See, we want God to fix them now, and we just give up. Instead of keep working at it, keep praying for them, keep pushing, keep planting a seed here and there. Because if you keep planting a seed, guess what? It might be the one that lands in the good ground. It might be the one that changes their whole life. Because we don't know what they're thinking. Oh, here they come again to preach at me. You know, God loves you. You walk away. Wait, wait, what? How can you love someone like, uh-oh, now we start a conversation. Don't you know what I've done? How could he possibly love someone like me? Thank you. Now I can talk to you. Because now they're receptive. Instead of just saying, dude, you're a waste. I'm done. I throw up my hands. I'm tired. Don't you think God would get tired too of listening to us whine and beg and plead and instead of going to him with expectation that his will be done, not ours. Psalm 23, 5. You anoint, you anoint my head with oil. The Lord who sanctifies me, Jehovah Makadesh. The old, in the Old Testament, the ch children of Israel had 613 laws that they had to keep to be holy in God's sight. Okay, I'm lucky if I can remember the Ten Commandments half the time, let alone 613 different laws. Now it makes more sense why people can't live up to the expectations. But out of those 613, how many of them were human laws that they slid in as God's laws? Because don't we like to put a lot of laws on people? Well, you've got to quit smoking. Well, you've got to quit drinking. Well, you've got to quit. You've got to quit. You've got to quit. Why? Who made you judge and jury? See, your job is not to tell them what they got to change. Your job is to introduce them to God, and then God can control what they need to change. Well, you shouldn't do that. Why? Maybe God wants them to do that to teach them a lesson. I mean, I know a lot of the stuff I did as a youth, and I've shared a lot of what I've done in the past. <coughs> But God never gave up on me. He never said, you're too far gone. He kept saying, come to me. And I would walk away. Come to me. And I would walk away. Come to me. I'm sure everyone in here has the same experience. I'm sure the first time, even if you grew up in church, even if you grew up in church, I am sure there was a time when God said, come to me. Turn to me for your needs. Turn to me for your peace. Turn to me for your comfort. But we had to make the choice. Psalm 23, 5, my cup runs over. The everlasting God, El Eloah. He's the cup of our salvation. He has done everything for us even before we did anything for him. Now there was right, I'm using all my time. Plus my little bit extra I got. <laughs> 
Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my inheritance. Jehovah Nachala. Ten different ways God is mentioned in Psalm 23. How can you worship a God that you don't even know? What all he does for us. And is that everything he does for us? No. That's just ten examples. How many of you have thought about praying that prayer just to praise God? But we don't. We only hear it at funerals. We think of negative things when we hear that prayer, but look how positive it is. That's the thing about prayer. How can you go into it if you don't know what you're getting, what you're receiving? You know, we went through this and we heard that God is our shepherd. He is our provider. He is our peace. He is our healer. He is our righteousness. He is our help. He is our banner. He is the everlasting God. And he is our inheritance. I'm hoping when, after hearing this, that when we go to prayer, we start remembering everything God is to us. That's who we're praying to. That's who wants to hear from us. That's who gave up everything so that we could have what we got. That's our God. Let's be proud of him. Let us go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for all that you are and all that you want to be for us. Father, help to open our eyes to see everything you want for us. Help us to see everything that you want to give us. And Father, just help give us the power to overcome our flesh, to not only complete our 21-day fast, but Father, also to remind us that your word is our guide. Your word is our light. So Father, with knowing that we're going to complete this 21-day fast and get closer to you, Father, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to get closer to you. We want to thank you for the opportunities that you provide for us throughout our lives. Father, just remind us to be thankful and help us to be joyous. And Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.